believe it. Tomorrow is the winter solstice, the middle of winter. From then on the days will slowly become longer and our nights shorter. A special hug to each and every one of you for joining us in our service of worship. To all our fathers, whether stand-in, functional or symbolic, a warm, happy Father's Day greeting. We are going to share some thoughts on weathering the storms of life. May you all receive much joy and stay blessed in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amidst the uncertainties we are all experiencing in the storms of life, let us ask God to be our vision as we sing.
Let us pray. The worst storms, Jesus, are the ones caused by our fear when we despair that the forces of sustenance and life are too weak to keep us going. Yet it is in the storm that we discover you as a source of love and kindness. In turbulence we find your reign. In struggle we discover our hidden strengths. We realize our need for you and each other in the ons onslaught of the wind and the waves. Lead us through sacrifice and self-giving to peace and calm. Amen. Today we reflect on the wonderful story of Mark 4 verses 35 to 41 where Jesus calms the sea. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with, were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is our scripture reading. Grass withers and flowers fade, but words of depth and truth last forever. Amen. In weathering the storms of life, you don't want to be caught sleeping. This is the advice given in Ephesians 5 verse 14. Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead. My late father, of whom I think today with much affection, had a similar philosophy. He often quoted Proverbs, Proverbs 24 verses 33 to 34 as fundamental to his philosophy of raising children. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber, and want like an armed warrior. Based on this, we had to wake up 4 a.m. in summer and 5 a.m. in winter to go for a jog, do some exercises, and after that, start the day with a scripture reading, hymn, and prayer. Then we had to settle down to study and to do our homework. And here we find Jesus asleep in a boat during a storm at night. His disciples are panicking, frantically using buckets to scoop out water to keep the boat afloat. Don't you care, Jesus? Wake up! Help us with the sail. Grab an oar. We need you. So Jesus got up, rebuked the storm and them. Then he went to sleep again. In my early days as a minister, I read this story as like, with Jesus in the boat, you are safe and protected. No longer. Yesterday, an acquaintance of many years died from COVID. He had a business in Botswana laying communication cables for the mines. Years ago, he was retrenched from Telcom due to restructuring and started on his own. He returned to South Africa for his annual visit to the, to the cardiologist. In the consulting rooms, he contracted the virus. Two weeks later, he was dead. And all his life he was active in the church, walking the talk of Jesus. 
This did not give him any protection against the ravages of the pandemic. It cannot be the point of the story. Fasting and praying and sackcloth and ashes are not effective in weathering the storms of life. There is something more profound at play here. In my opinion, Jesus was sleeping in the storm to prepare his disciples for his eventual departure. They had to learn to do things for themselves. Recently, a new work, wokeness, crept into our vocabulary. Being woke means to be aware of issues like racism, discrimination against women, the abuse of children, xenophobia and homophobia. It has become a meme. Hashtag stay woke. Be alert to injustice. Keep questioning. Perhaps this is the point of the story of Jesus asleep in the boat. During a period where we are asking why God does not intervene in the pandemic, in wars, in atrocities, in natural disasters, a time when we in our most hidden thoughts think God is asleep. In this era, God wants us to be woke. Perhaps it is because of this deeply enmeshed Christian idea of being awake, of wokeness, that we don't want to be caught sleeping. I took what I call a power nap one afternoon this week. My phone rang and I answered. Sorry, did I wake you up? Somebody said. No, I lied. Sleep is embarrassingly private. We lose, we lose control when we sleep. Our facial features become contorted. Sometimes we drool or snore or lie in awkward positions or speak gibberish. We are so vulnerable when we sleep. Early babies look like angels when sleeping. We adults normally not. But sleep can be rejuvenating and creative. August Kekule, the famous German chemist of the late 19th century, had a strange dream. He dreamt of the Uroboros symbol, the snake biting its tail. And when he woke up, he realized this circular structure is the essence of the benzene molecule he had been struggling to model. Even God is said to have taken a good rest on the seventh day after he had created the universe in six days. Our text says the disciples took him with them in the boat just as he was. Now how was Jesus? Let me tell you, dead tired, bedraggled, worn out, exhausted. He had been teaching, preaching, healing, helping, doing Jesus wanted them to take him to the other side, away from the crowds for a rest, and he fell asleep on the cushion in the stern of the boat. Sometimes, sleep is a way to escape things. Jonah was sent by God to the Arabs, to Nineveh. He hated them, so he bought a ticket on a ship going in the exact opposite direction. And then he fell asleep. And finally the sailors threw him overboard and he was rudely awakened by God to what he had to do. This was not why Jesus slept. He was taking a well-earned rest. What was it that tired Jesus out so much? His idealism. The tension between how things are and how they should be. Jesus was obsessed with bringing about a new future for his people. He called this the kingdom of God. He cured, fixed, helped and prepared people for this new future. Those called to the ministry are often idealists. We feel we want to change the world in one go. When things don't work out, 
we easily become disheartened, despondent. We want to go to bed, cover ourselves under a blanket and just sleep and sleep. When Elijah experienced huge opposition to his work and ideals, he prayed to God to kill him. I've experienced it in my own life. As a young minister, I had imagined that perhaps South Africa would be taken over by communists. I would be put in front of a firing squad and asked to renounce my faith or die. And then I would refuse and the guns would fire and I would slump over. There would be flags hanging half-mast and eulogies and the martyrology. It never happened. That was my idealism. It got tempered by the realities of church life. I had to learn the hard way the value of small gestures. After being legitimized to preach, I was invited to the church where I grew up to deliver a sermon. My then fiancé and later wife pitched up without wearing a hat. My own family was up in arms saying the biggest sins are brought into the church by the wives of ministers. It was a small gesture, but things changed. In 1982, I was one of 13 ministers who signed a vote of protest at the General Assembly against the church's policy of excluding blacks as members. In the little congregation which I served part-time, I opened up the church to all black and white, gay and straight. I baptized babies of same-sex couples. I blessed same-sex marriage marriages. I explored new avenues in theology and I preached and teach that Jonah was not really swallowed by a big fish and that the donkey of Balaam did not really talk and that the universe was not really created in six days, but that these are folk tales and myths carrying much deeper meanings. It caused me and my family much trauma and hurt and sleepless nights. Three times I was charged by the church for misconduct and for heresy. Our scripture reading says, other boats were with him. And I was, I was fortunate to have always been surrounded by others, a family and good people like you who were willing to support me and accept me when I was vulnerable and carry me when I was tired. And somehow I weathered many storms. And the church gradually changed and is still changing. Once after a service I stood at the door to greet people. I was wearing my robe and a young boy came to me and asked me, what is this? I explained it was a robe that ministers wear when they preach. Why? he asked. I told him that the Roman officials wore these robes and that the Emperor Constantine allowed priests to wear it too. But the Romans are long gone, hundreds of years, this bright young boy said. And the only answer I could think of was, this is the church. And we don't want to change too quickly. We should never underestimate small gestures. A young man asked me to be with him when he broke the news to his parents that he was gay. I did. It worked out well. And his parents reacted with love and acceptance. A family asked me to help them confronting their dad about his alcoholism. I did. He agreed to go for rehab and is dry to this day. I was asked to talk to rebellious teenagers, which I did, and over the years they calmed down and settled in. Gradually my own idealism was tempered by realizing that I should not have a low opinion of little things and little gestures, a smile, a covert lockdown, elbow shake, a phone call, an SMS, a gesture of support, a moment of attention, a donation, a gift. Each one of these is a rebuke of the storm, a rebuke to despair and hopelessness. At university I was privileged 
to have been elected the chair of the Reformed Students Association. We decided to build a raft during the university's RAG carnival. An engineering student did the design, others donated time and enthusiasm, businesses donated materials, we worked day and night to have it finished, fired up by coffee and sometimes something stronger. The raft won the prize for the most original one. Proceeds went to charity. And when the festival ended, one of my friends, exhausted and with dark rings around his eyes, said, It's the best tired I have ever been. St. John of the Cross, that famous mystic of the 17th century, wrote, And I saw a lake over which every soul must pass to reach the kingdom of heaven. And the name of that lake was Suffering. And then I saw a boat which carries souls across the lake. And the name of that boat was Love. Amen. As a prayer, we listen to the hymn, Guide me, O thou great Redeemer. Oh.
God establishes us in a world which is both calm and chaotic, supportive and sinister. Handle it with love and compassion. And may God guide you through the storms of life. May Jesus restore you and strengthen you. May the Holy Spirit encourage you when the skies are dark and the waves high. And may God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit watch over you as you weather the storms of life. Amen.